Government legislation is increasingly used to break strikes. We just saw this at York University. Uh, there is a massive drive to reorganize work and intensify it, to speed up production using robotics and computerization. In other words, what Marx has called the rate of exploitation. Most of the serious studies suggest that the global working class increased by an order of four. It increased, it quadrupled between 1980 and, 19, and 2005. But that in East Asia, the, global, the working class increased nine times in size. So this is where you get a huge restructuring and reorganization. Why? Because they find very profitable sources of cheaper labor within the world system which can still meet adequate levels of productivity to allow them to produce. So I think neoliberalism in important respects worked for global capital. It made capitalism more profitable. But I follow Marx entirely on this. A wave of capitalist expansion is inevitably contradictory and it throws up the seeds of a new crisis. And in particular it does because the nature of capitalism is competition between firms which are competing for the same markets. But the problem is if every capitalist out there producing cell phones, steel, automobiles, blue jeans, and so on is doing this, if they're all doing it, and they're all introducing new technologies, building new state-of-the-art factories, and so on, the system starts to move to a point which Marx called over-accumulation. The capacity to produce massively exceeds the amount of goods that can be sold profitably. So what I'm trying to suggest, in other words, is that neoliberal capitalism did expand from 1982 on. The locus of that expansion was East Asia, particularly China. But the first sign that that wave of expansion was running into severe contradictions was the Asian crisis of 1997 when you get a terrible, wrenching crisis in South Korea, Thailand, Indonesia, the Philippines, Malaysia, Taiwan, and so on. Those economies go into a massive contraction. And in the United States, the Federal Reserve Bank, in the course of 1997 and 98, panicked because the crisis in East Asia was still going on when the Russian economy started to tank and long-term capital management, the hedge fund that I mentioned, start, uh, disintegrated in the US. And the Federal Reserve Bank walked in and they started massively cutting interest rates and they said to themselves, we are going to flood the system with credit. We are going to flood the system with credit to prevent a global collapse. And I believe that they bought 10 years. That fundamentally, they used the credit system to get working class consumers and corporations and banks to borrow massively to fund expenditures in a way that was utterly unsustainable. I think how we understand the crisis becomes really crucial to thinking about the politics of the crisis. And if I'm right that we're experiencing, this a, 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 experiencing now a systemic crisis of global capitalism in its neoliberal phase, then it means that we need to think about systemic responses. And a left that is thinking systemically right now about it, and not simply in terms of re-regulating, or not even in simply in terms of addressing the banking sector, but is really thinking about the system as a whole, and secondly, is thinking globally. Okay, so that then takes me to talking for a few minutes, coming back then to the question of, of politics. And here, I'll start by reminding you of what I said in my introductory remarks. There's a profound ideological crisis. The really massive inability of the mainstream to account for this crisis is of immense importance to us on the left right now. It has created enormous openings 
There is an opening for radical anti-capitalist analysis from the left about this crisis that really hasn't been out there uh, for a very, very long time. And that's, uh, that's a starting point for all of my reflections on this. I say that fully aware of how difficult many, many things are going to be in the labor movement and on the left. I mean, when I came out from Toronto to Winnipeg and then to Vancouver earlier this week, members of the Canadian auto workers were voting on concessions contracts to give back wages, benefits, holiday time, breaks, and so on to the corporations in order to save their jobs. But I do want to insist there are going to be important openings, but they're going to require a number of things uh, of, the, of the left. And when I talk about the left, I'm really pointing to what I think is the left that's going to emerge throughout this crisis. I don't mean the left that looks like it has for the past number of decades. Because part of my assessment of what's happening is that in a certain really important sense, new lefts are starting to emerge in this period in which those who are serious from the pre-existing left can play really significant roles of contributing, supporting, helping to add analysis and perspective and historical range of understanding and, and so on. Obviously, when I talk about new lefts emerging, we have to recognize, first off, that that process has been going on in parts of the world in quite significant ways already, particularly Latin America. And it's really, really important to recognize that there has been now for several years an open discussion and debate, I underline that point, and debate about socialism for the 21st century, which originates in discussions in Venezuela, and of course the struggle in Bolivia has introduced a new dimension in which indigenous liberation politics become part of that discussion in a much more powerful way. We also need to recognize that the reason these discussions are happening is because in some areas we've seen already early on into the crisis very, very significant mobilizations. I'm just going to give you a few examples because I think it's important for us to start to put together a picture of what's been happening. I was really struck that this year began with a factory occupation in Chicago. I mean, remember, in the 1930s, it took four or five years into the crisis before the factory occupation and the sit-down strike really emerge as the decisive forms of struggle. But we've already had in Chicago a factory occupation at Republic Windows and Doors, which was so immensely popular among working class people in the area that even Barack Obama had to say that they've got a legitimate cause. Well, of course, that's his home ground, right? Um, and again, keep in mind the history, many of the leaders of that occupation came out of the really important immigrants' rights mobilization of the last couple of years, including the big May Day mobilizations of a year and a half ago. So these are people who have already started in their own way to recreate the American labor movement in new ways. But of course at a you know, more important, larger scale, uh, is the month-long rebellion in Greece. And I do want to spend a moment on it because of the way it was captured by the media in North America, where they said, well, for some reason we don't understand, there was an outpouring of emotion, ongoing protest over the police murder of a teenager. Well, hang on now. First off, it was a police murder of a teenage activist. It was seen as political from the start. Secondly, it was in the context of enormous popular hatred of the government. This was a government which was responding to the crisis by proceeding with privatization, by trying to bring in a lower minimum wage for youth, was trying to cut teacher salaries, that's why there was a general strike of teachers throughout the course of this, was trying, in other words, to have more neoliberalism on top of the crisis of neoliberalism. Or take Iceland, where we have actually the first government toppled as a result of its agreement with the International Monetary Fund over this crisis. 
we've ne we're now seeing the emergence in parts of Europe, both a very large scale social mobilization already fairly early days into the crisis, uh, which in one country have produced quite interesting new political party of the left, the new anti-capitalist party uh, that goes out with 10,000 members and is you know, mobilizing in the streets and, and so on. Uh, and I think in many ways when I, t when I say it's a context in which a new left can begin to emerge. That, this is really the process that I'm talking about. New modes of resistance to the crisis, new political formations on the left, where frankly, currents and the new generation of radicals and so on come together, dedicated to breaking with some of the old sectarianisms, because let's face it, that's going to be crucial to the emergence of a new left. And also I think a few other things will be. I think this new left is going to have to be incredibly and intransigently anti-racist and anti-imperialist in its convictions. Because one of the things we're seeing in response to the crisis is a knee-jerk labor protectionism. We're getting some of it from our own Canadian Labor Congress the idea that somehow our, our task is to defend Canadian jobs as if the Canadian job is morally superior to the Mexican or Chinese job. The placard that some striking British oil workers carried last month which said British jobs for British workers, that's what they were on strike about because they wanted the Spanish workers sent home and so on. That kind of nationalistic labor protectionism is going to be an issue that this new left is going to have to confront head on in insisting that we are a movement dedicated to global justice, global interests of workers, and anti-racism and anti-imperialism. Particularly because in the early stages of this crisis, migrant workers are really bearing the brunt. So unless we have a left that takes seriously, for example, the kinds of campaigns that groups like No One Is Illegal prosecute in cities like Vancouver and Toronto and others and really take that to heart that this is a struggle that must put the interests of migrant workers of the those who are most vulnerable in terms of status and challenge all of the racialized narratives that come out in a crisis like this uh, I don't think we'll be doing our duty also anti-imperialist because we're going to see more things like Ecuador. Some of you may know, Ecuador is the first government in this crisis so far to say that it will not repay some of its foreign debts. They simply say, we don't agree. If this crisis means paying off foreign bankers or making sure that the people are fed, it's an easy choice. And I think we're going to see more of this, the question of standing up and repudiating debts the international financial institutions, many of which are based here, particularly if you look at foreign investment in the Caribbean and so on, Canadian banks are very, very important in that regard, but also increasingly in parts of Latin America, we're going to need an anti-imperialist dimension which really understands the, com the complicities of Canadian capitalist institutions in trying to punish movements and governments in the global south that, that try to stand up. I also think that it's that we're talking about a left that is, has to get incredibly imaginative about the way in which it works, both comes together and reaches out to other constituencies and communities. I can only share with you a little bit of the experience that some of us have in Toronto right now where a number of movements and organizations have come together to create something called the Popular Education and Action Project. This is something that involves the Coalition Against Israeli Apartheid, the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty, No One Is Illegal, New Socialist Group, Socialist Project, a small little community group called Basics. Uh, and we've come together and we've basically said, we are going to create a common front of the left in this city to do popular education and action around the crisis. So really what I'm trying to say is that if I'm at all right that we're talking about a new systemic global crisis of neoliberal capitalism, then it's a time for the left to think way more creatively, way more imaginatively than we had in a long time. It's going to mean breaking with some the sectarian habits which have dominated in some quarters, and it's going to mean putting things like anti-racism and popular education really to the forefront. As I say, 
people in Latin America and Europe are already blazing certain kinds of trails for us, and I think part of our responsibility is not to let them down and start to do, even if on much smaller scales because of where we are, start to move in the same kind of direction. So thank you very much.